Thanks. Let me see. Let me just restart. There we go. All right. So um, I hope that the paper will help to set the stage for you for COP26 that's about to start in Glasgow on November 1st. The paper was motivated to a large extent by the UK presidency's call as one of the goals, in fact, the first goal of COP26 to bring the world to net zero 2050 pledges as an answer to the climate change crisis that we are facing together. The key point that I make in the paper is that this particular focus of net zero 2050 pledges, as it was outlined by the Institute for Energy Law in response to the UK presidency's request has significant problems. And these problems come from the fact that what net zero pledges 2050 rely upon is a political economy approach. This political economy approach looks for, and I'm quoting here the IEA report, the most technically feasible, cost-effective, and socially acceptable energy transition solution. What my concern with this approach was, was that political economy approaches that look in particular to efficiency, technical feasibility, and social acceptability do not have an eye on rights. And they do not have an eye on the meeting of obligations in the way that lawyers would think about it. So we have a political economy approach to something that I consider to be fundamentally a legal problem. And the key thing that I hope to provide with Diligent Zero is a perspective that suggests that if we move away from the narrow path set out in the IEAs and the UK presidency's focus on net zero 2050 pledges, we may get to a different, more bottom-up governance-based paradigm to energy transition policy and energy transition regulation. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is something that makes me particularly thankful to present this paper at Notre Dame. It is that one of the key things that any global policy must bring to bear is a concern for human dignity. And in this concern for human dignity, I rely to a great extent on the work, pioneering work by Notre Dame law faculty, such as Professor Diane Desierto, Professor Paolo Carozza, and also Professor Bruce Huber, whose work on energy law and environmental law really has greatly influenced my thinking on these matters. So if you take human dignity as one of the key concerns that energy transition must serve, one has to look at the many consequences intended and unintended that net zero 2050 pledges would have. And I lay out in the article that there are many unanticipated and to a certain extent anticipated consequences that net zero 2050 pledges have to take into account but don't have the means to fully incorporate. These include negative development impacts in the global south. The IEA report notes that such impacts are inevitable, tries to provide a framework to tee up how they might be addressed to a certain extent, but in the end says, well, the cost of doing nothing is greater than the cost of doing this, therefore we should do this. I would submit that that is not quite the correct framework to look at it, which is not the IEA's fault. It was not asked to provide that, but this is where we as lawyers come in. The next point that I would submit to you is that there is an ecological impact that is as of yet not fully baked into net zero 2050 pledges. This ecological impact is perhaps somewhat counterintuitive because to a certain extent we think when we think about climate change that anything that is good for climate change is also good for ecology in general, but that is not quite true. In fact, you will see that some of the most frequent claimants against renewable 
energy projects, for instance, in the United States, particularly wind projects, are going to claim that such projects are inconsistent with the Endangered Species Act, for instance, because there are bird strikes and bat strikes associated with these projects. So we need to bake these ecological challenges into our perspective as well. But most importantly, and this is, I think, where the paper hopefully makes the biggest contribution, I suggest that supply chains must more fully be put into the frame of diligent energy transition policy decision-making. These supply chains create a host of human rights, ecological and climate issues that as of yet have not been fully articulated as part and parcel of this net zero 2050 governance approach. The examples I would have for you here are three, uh, and I make them in the paper in more detail. One of them is the Conga mine project in Peru, which is a copper gold mine that is operated by Newmont, had World Bank support um, and had therefore to go through reasonably rigorous diligence standards this mine was supposed to be operational in 2014-15 and due to significant local opposition has still not gotten off the ground. This opposition is couched in human rights terms and indigenous rights terms and has found the support of the Peruvian Supreme Court at this point. The other project that I look at is the Jadar mine project in Serbia, a project for lithium mining to be operated by Rio Tinto one of the strongest global mining companies when it comes to commitments for environmental and social governance. And yet this project has run into significant delays in Serbia uh, for a failure to take into account local community concerns. And finally, cobalt mining in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which leads to significant environmental and human rights problems in the Democratic Republic of Congo because of artisanal mining as well as um, regularly licensed mining. And these examples need to be borne in mind for two reasons. One is it is going to be reasonably impossible to meet the renewable energy pledges that are included in net zero 2050 scenarios if we do not have these raw materials. Copper, lithium, cobalt are fundamental to our ability to meet the uh, pledge scenarios, and yet when these mines don't get off the ground for human rights and environmental reasons, we're going to have real problems to meet the pledge as it stands. And uh, um, the IEA would tell you that there is a 700% increased need of these raw materials by 2030. Lithium at this point has a predicted shortfall in 2028 on existing demand. This math doesn't add up, so we need to find a different way to solve our problem. The way that I suggest, let me just look how I'm doing on time, apologies, um, is a holistic approach to decision-making that brings these human rights and environmental concerns into climate governance. This holistic approach that I suggest is one that is premised in due diligence. Due diligence is a legal tool that we already are intimately familiar with in environmental law, in climate law, and in human rights law. And we are familiar with it on the domestic administrative front, as well as on the international front. The key to combining these frameworks is that we no longer look at an answer of what do we need to do. We look at a question of how do we need to do it. And this how we need to do it, I suggest, has three steps. The first is that we need to engage in robust risk assessment, a robust risk assessment that engages with local communities from the earliest possible moment in order to determine whether or not the supply chains can in fact be feasibly built, whether or not these supply chains can be built in a manner that is human rights compliant, and whether or not the resulting global energy backbone is going to be consistent with sustainable development goals. 
once we have done this risk assessment and have engaged with local communities to establish what risks it is that these communities would like us to take into account, we need to plan for risk mitigation in our development plans for the supply chains, as well as for our energy policies. One of the things that I suggest in the paper is that it will be impossible to meet all of our obligations on the human rights, climate, and ecological front at once. We are currently in an urgent crisis situation in which we will have to find ways in which to make the good not the enemy of the perfect, and therefore find a governance tool that solves problems, even though we will be underachieving what we ordinarily would expect is possible. Now, what I suggest is that that is not something that should lead us to say, well, we are in an emergency mode, everything is permissible because we must answer to a crisis. What I suggest is that what we must do instead is establish on the basis of factual investigations and risk mitigation planning what the specific consequences of our policies are, in, are likely to be, and then pick policies that are as best as we can make them on the basis of a Pareto optimal comparison of different pathways comparing their climate developmental and ecological impact. At the end of that, my argument is that we must also build in robust risk monitoring. Again, this robust risk monitoring is already part and parcel of due diligence frameworks in domestic law, as well as in international law. So this is not something that is going to be reasonably unexpected. When I say Pareto optimal pathways, what that suggests is that there are incommensurate values that we each must satisfy and where what we are looking for is a policy approach that is such that we cannot improve on outcomes without reducing the outcome on another scale. We can't improve human rights impacts without having a negative ecological impact, for example. That suggests that these three are wholly independent from each other and that they are on an equal footing. My argument is going to be that this is not quite right. Ecology, climate, and human rights are interconnected in actuality. In actual policy decision-making, we are going to be able to compare outcomes on a scale because impacts are going to track on all three. Just as importantly, I think that with a human dignity framework in mind, the development perspective and the perspective of human rights must be first amongst equals. What I suggest to you is that to the extent any policy initiative has the consequence of impairing and reducing the fundamental rights of any one group, that is deeply problematic and would require significant explanation. And the only way that that explanation would be satisfactory is if we could establish that there is no way in which any one person would be made the better off if we followed a different approach. What I mean by that is we are looking at the position of the worst situated group and are saying, do we have the best worst situated group in principle in light of our development perspective? What I suggest through this exercise is that we can then have a robust engagement on the facts, that we can have fundamentally different energy transition frameworks that are possible, not just one, and that maybe we need to move away from net zero 2050 pledges to a more flexible approach to the highest possible achievement to energy transition governance and climate governance. Let me just see how I'm doing on time giving you back a minute early um, to sort of give you this as a framework. I'm really looking forward to your comments and thoughts on this. Um, last thing I will say is I'm currently working with OPEC in order to bring this to COP26. So your comments will hopefully also have some impact on negotiating positions as we get to Glasgow.
So with that, let me take notes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sojas. And I, I'll turn the floor on to uh, Professor Bruce Weber for his comments in the uh, discussion. Thank you, uh, Jean-Marc. And if anybody, if at any point here you can't hear me well, or if my video freezes, please let me know. I've been notified that we have some connectivity issues from London at the moment. Uh, but let me begin by thanking Professor Sorgans. It's uh, such an honor to have you here. I'm so sorry that you could not have joined us in person. I suppose it's uh, no net loss to me in that sense that I'm that I'm not there with you in any event, but I do regret that you're not able to uh, see Notre Dame's campus in all its glory, take in a football game, and most of all, meet our wonderful students there in, in the room uh, and interact with them and, and learn from them. But we are honored to have you there. And for those of you that are in the room, uh, I want to urge you to take uh, everything that Professor Sorgens is saying very seriously. He has a wealth of experience and expertise in the areas about which he has uh, has spoken and communicated. And, uh, and he has a voice that, that uh, wholly deserves to be taken very seriously, though I confess that I am slightly daunted about the prospect of you incorporating anything that I or anyone else has to say into your negotiating position before uh, COP26. Um, you have said so much uh, today and in your paper that is obviously correct and right uh, that it is difficult for me to do anything other than to simply repeat and underscore and, um, and emphasize much of what you have uh, already said. So. Uh, at risk of, of repeating some of what you have just said, let me be explicit about the aspects that I, I uh, take to be exactly uh, right, and, and maybe even encourage you to amplify uh, to amplify these aspects in, in the in the paper and in your presentations of it. But first of all, uh, I, I think that you are exactly right to uh, criticize the primacy of accounts that are based solely or largely on political economy. Um, the logic of economics, of incentives, of rational action, and so forth have, have so thoroughly permeated our discourse, and in my view, even impoverished it, that in matters of environmental law and policy, it is now much more difficult to, to speak of notions that should be at the center of law, notions like duty and application, even sacrifice, ethics, community autonomy, and, and so forth. Uh, your emphasis early in your presentation on, on the law and the centrality of human dignity to the essence of law, I think, are important, whereas instead so much of, of political economy uh, approaches derive from essentially uh, actors telling us what we want to hear and to implying that the costs of action uh, are low and minimal and playing off of incentives that they take as given rather than trying to shape those incentives or even teach or instruct as to what uh, as to what the goals of, of, uh, of human flourishing and human dignity rightly uh, uh, should be regarded or conceived. Um, secondly, I, I think that you're exactly right to, to expand the focus uh, of our environmental analysis beyond simplistic accounts of, of solely the environmental good. It is, it is manifestly clear that to uh, emphasize our environmental goals in isolation from the goals of human rights, of workers' rights, of economic well-being, human flourishing more generally, would be a, a, a grievous error. It's understandable, I think, to, uh, to uh, appreciate how that error has come about. I think policymakers so badly want to believe that there are straightforward solutions uh, and, and they attempt to garner support by making their, their solutions seem more straightforward, seem more uh, obvious and intuitive uh, than they actually are. Of course, the downside of such approaches is that they risk uh, misleading people, that they oversimplify. Um, I think in part also, this is yet another uh, example of how we have uh, allowed um, the private sector to deliver the message uh, that we, in, uh, as a public square, ought pr appropriately to be addressing. I think it's far easier, for example, to uh, make people feel better about themselves for buying an electric car than it is to do the hard work of figuring out, as you indicate, where does that car come from? Who builds it? Under what conditions? What minerals go into that battery? What mines do those minerals come from? And, and so forth. Asking those kinds of questions 
about, as you say, the broader ecological impact associated with the massive transitions that are demanded by a net zero type of approach uh, misses entirely the, the effects of the supply chain effects, the knock on effects, many of which will be located geographically outside of the United States and therefore are uh, outside of the view, I shouldn't even say the limited our approach here to the United States, but really to the developed world more generally. Um, and so I think simple notions of, of, of equity demand that uh, we take into account the knock-on or the follow-on effects of supply chain changes as dramatic as the ones that we are envisioning uh, on the developing world. I think this is, uh, this is obvious. I think you're absolutely right to, to state this so clearly as you do in the paper and to call attention to this crucial point. Uh, a, a third aspect that I think you have exactly right, and this, this uh, I suppose, follows in somewhat um, from the previous point, is that if you do uh, take a more holistic view as you encourage and you incorporate goals of human rights with environmental, ecological, climate change goals and so forth, uh, inevitably it will have, in my view, the salutary effect of, of uh, requiring a more cautious, a more measured, and ultimately one would hope a more successful approach towards, uh, towards public policy. This would be in marked uh, contrast to the public discourse that uh, takes center stage these days in debates over just about any public policy, but, but energy, uh, energy and energy transition included. Um, in the paper, you made a, a wonderful uh, point, I thought, about the Texas energy crisis, which since you didn't repeat it here, I'm just going to share it with the students who are in the room. But one of the points you made about the Texas energy crisis was that at one level, it could be regarded as a significant failure of public policymakers in Texas. Those of you in the room may recall that this past winter, there was a dramatic cold spell in Texas that resulted in uh, the, the, the uh, shutdown of certain uh, of significant portions of the Texas energy system. And in many quarters, this was regarded as sort of an uh, abject failure of, uh, of the policymaking apparatus in Texas. And I suppose there are aspects of that narrative uh, that are true. Uh, but one point that Professor Sorgens makes very well in his paper is to point out that from another perspective, it's not so easy to fault Texas policymakers who at the time that that decision was made and took account of the risk of uh, certain cold weather uh, events and so forth and, and made essentially a cost benefit analysis about uh, what that outcome uh, might have looked like as essentially making a design decision to design the system to be resilient to a certain kind of risk, but perhaps not the kind of risk that eventually uh, that eventually took hold. Now, it would be easy, and indeed the American political style would be to simply lay a great deal of blame on Texas pol uh, policymakers, but perhaps a more measured response would be to say that we have now uh, learned a valuable lesson from, uh, from this. We now might assess the nature of the risks in, in, uh, in the Texas grid more seriously. We might make systemic changes. We might onboard that and allow a sort of an iterative decision-making process to take hold, which would enable us ultimately to take account of a greater variety of factors, including not simply the environmental ones, but also other public policy relevant factors such as human well-being or uh, the kinds of other factors that flow from energy policy more, more generally. Um, finally, I, I think another thing that you have uh, hit the nail, another way that you've hit the nail on the head um, is with the centrality of this concept of, of due diligence, which is uh, front and center, even in the title of, of your uh, paper. I think this is an excellent point of focus. Um, it, it probably has even greater resonance for those uh, of you who are familiar with continental legal systems and with international law, where, where substantive obligations are the tools of the trade. Um, as Professor Sorgens and those of you in the room probably know well, I think American law has a has a fairly reductive approach to specifying obligations that uh, in, in, this, in the following sense that, that uh, courts in the United States uh, tend to pay the most rigorous attention to those obligations that are carefully spe specified, that are liquidated in a, in a document. I apologize for this. Let me see if I can mute that phone. My office phone never rings, so I have no idea how to make it mute. I apologize for this simple technology. Stop it. There we go. Let's apologize for that. Um, it, it, that reductive approach taken by American courts tends to cause us as lawyers, I think, to give short shrift to, uh, to 
terms like due diligence that are pregnant with meaning, but that we tend to reduce to sort of the lowest common denominator or uh, to a, a degree or an approach that, that uh, will simply pass muster and, and, uh, and get us through the next round of negotiation or perhaps the next round of litigation. It's not that way throughout the rest of the world where, common, uh, where, where values, where principles um, take on a, a much greater uh, meaning and where lawyers are unafraid to argue on the normative basis uh, as to what those concepts require, what those principles require. And I think diligence is exactly the sort of concept that um, in the American lawyerly context, we tend to reduce to, um, to first and second year associates doing their dirty work on a deal. Uh, due diligence is the stuff of the junior associate that no one really wants to have a, 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 to touch on. But no, diligence in the, uh, in, in, the, in the world context, I think has a much greater, a much more affirmative, a much more, um, uh, uh, rich sense, uh, a set of echoes um, that uh, that connote, as as you indicate in the paper so well, uh, a responsibility to think thoroughly through a problem, to uh, take a holistic view, and and um, to incorporate all the values that bear upon a, a particular decision. Now, I suppose um, I, I wouldn't be doing my job as a commenter if I didn't also say something critical or urge you to develop the uh, argument in, in certain respects. So I will simply make two small uh, small points that perhaps you can you can speak to if the room gives you a, a moment to do so. Um, I suppose one concern that that uh, arises for me in connection with an enhanced notion of, of uh, diligence is as follows. Certainly in, in the American environmental experience, uh, more disclosure, more process, and more information uh, tend to lead to more litigation. Uh, as I think you note in your paper, uh, litigation under the National Environmental Policy Act, which is of course the, the law that gives rise to the environmental impact statement requirement and more generally to the whole process of environmental impact analysis, um, has become something of a, a bludgeon used by environmental groups these days in order to stop projects uh, that they dislike from moving forward. I don't, I don't say that uh, pejoratively. In many instances, though, there are projects that should be uh, terminated or abrogated at, at any cost and by any means necessary, perhaps, one might, might take, that, take that view. But nonetheless, it, uh, as you say in the paper, is the case that, that uh, enhanced disclosure requirements and informational requirements can lead to not only enhanced liability, but to more litigation, which then delays and gums up the work. So I guess I would be curious as to how you might uh, assess this risk of paralysis by analysis or un, uh, a litigation risk and such. And the second uh, question I would have for you um, has to do with the, the, the way that you would imagine this diligence notion, this enhanced diligence notion to be diffused throughout um, the energy sector and, and really to the relevant actors more generally. Um, as you again note in the paper, the, the, the projects that we are concerned about, the, the uh, actual productive efforts along the supply chain up and down are undertaken by market actors that are spread throughout the economy, really spread throughout various economies around the world. And as we've seen in the last you know, 50 years, really the, the, the regulatory uh, state, though enhanced in its, um, in its, uh, its uh, what shall I say, social powers vis-a-vis -vis the corporation, with respect to economic matters often is now take a more withdrawn approach. Um, and the market really is, has, uh, has emerged as the principal means of uh, allocating productive effort around uh, around the world. So I guess I'm curious as to uh, in that context where the diligence um, required of the entities that are making rules on the ground would have to be undertaken principally by private market market actors. I'd be curious to know more about how you envision uh, enhanced view of diligence uh, permeating uh, the the market in that in that sense. If I'm a you know a wind developer and I, I see the world as one big possible wind farm and I'm out there, I might be inclined to avoid uh, dense regulatory environments and uh, really again to minimize the kind of due diligence that I, I as a corporate actor am obligated to to, uh, to undertake and um, 
I, I'm just curious, where would you, where you would imagine the legal pressure, the legal force to undertake a more thoroughgoing analysis uh, would come from? As I say, those are merely uh, uh, questions that I, I might urge you to, to develop as you, as you build out this argument. But on the whole, I, I want to underscore that I thought this was a fantastic effort, and I especially appreciated um, the, the way you articulated it here to our, our students. So thank you again very much for your presentation. I'll, I'll give you now a few moments to, uh, to respond. Thank you so, so much. That was fantastic. And I'm, I'm glad that um, the paper communicated as well as it did, because it, it was something that, you know, a, a first draft of it was a little bit more impassioned. So I got the comment of, you might want to dial that back a little bit. So it's good that it works now. Um, to answer your questions, um, in terms of the risk of paralysis, I think I have sort of two answers to that. One of them is a realistic kind of, you know, realpolitik answer. And that is that risk of paralysis is the very reason that anything that tries to do anything by 2050 is simply unachievable. We cannot get mining projects of the scale needed to bring the copper, lithium, cobalt out of the ground fast enough. It will be impossible. We're chasing a paradigm that at the moment of thinking of it has been made futile by reality. This cannot, will not, must not work. Which means that if we know this right now, we should not be chasing after pledge, uh, net zero 2050 pledges. They're wrong. They cannot work. We need to focus on things that are actually feasible in terms of emission reduction and in terms of a curve that can bring us to Paris compliance with the possible overshoot scenario. So in terms of the paralysis that is built in, that is very much one of my kind of realpolitik points of, you know, get real UK presidency, this can't work. In terms of how do we do this better? I think one of the things that is really, really important is that this litigation risk reduces drastically to the extent that there is appropriate local community engagement at the earliest stages. So Femi Ajibola is a, a Nigerian law professor that I rely on in the piece that, that brings together a, a really wonderful story of how Chevron finally got it right in a Nigerian project. They brought in local stakeholders and made local communities part and parcel of building the project and gave capacity to those local communities to actually have a positive impact in the way they want to have the impact rather than in the way that the World Bank and foreign companies believed it would be in the best interest of people in the Niger Delta to be governed. That is something that, to my mind, always goes wrong. It has, even though well-intentioned, a smell of colonialism to it that um, we would do well to avoid. And it has that smell even when we do it domestically. Because to the extent that we don't engage appropriately with local communities, it is, you know, this is something that will sound oddly familiar to people if they've watched the news, right? It's those Washington elitists that are telling us what to do. Well, to the extent that you want to get rid of that, there needs to be community engagement at the earliest stages in order to avoid litigation. Now, get real Freddie. Obviously, there will always be litigation. To the extent that you have trillions of dollars at stake, people are going to sue. But those lawsuits are going to be a lot faster to handle and a lot easier to diffuse to the extent that that community engagement has happened in the right way. So in terms of that paralysis, I think we need to bake it in more, know that we can forestall it through better community engagement. And um, to the extent that we can't, we need to have a realistic time frame. I mean, you know, a, a mine that was supposed to be in commercial operation in 2015 isn't. Uh, we are now, what, six years out, and it's going to look like it's going to be a lot longer. We need to think that we can easily add a decade to most contentious projects, and we simply need to bake that into our supply chain assumptions. So that we, sort of on, on, on question one. On question two, 
where does the legal force come from? I think there are various ways in which I anticipate this could go. Um, one is that you have countries such as Germany passing supply chain diligence laws. So there would be an obligation on businesses that operate in Germany or in the German marketplace to do that kind of diligence. The Dutch courts have gotten incredibly aggressive in terms of piercing corporate veils in order to hold parent companies liable for human rights abuses by their subsidiaries. Um, and one of the things that I would anticipate would be a defense to those kind of lawsuits would be an appropriate diligence um, effort. Um, so I think there would be certainly on the European side, a legal foothold. In the US, we have less of one. The Alien Torts Claims uh, Statute would have been one, but that has been made less potent of late. Um, in terms of how do I see this as a design element, to the extent we build market mechanisms into the Paris rulebook going forward, those market mechanisms must fundamentally support this kind of diligence. Um, anyone who as a private actor cannot prove compliance with these kinds of basic human rights diligence obligations and basic environmental diligence obligations should simply not get a certified credit when they want to participate in carbon markets. Um, my sense would be that, and that is something that I need to add to the paper as a design feature. Um, to the extent we do that, I think we could build into the uh, Paris rulebook a stronger check on the how and um, create incentives for companies to do better. Um, as it stands, I mean, ESG is doing reasonably well. I mean, okay, people will argue the human rights um, advocates uh, are still saying that ESG is basically a publicity stunt. Um, what I would answer to them is it has moved precisely from public relations to the legal department at most uh, large resource and energy firms because it is now thought of as creating legal disclosure problems. Well, that is the move that is the key move if you want to actually make ESG legally enforceable. So we're actually seeing now the changes in corporate departments at large energy and natural resource firms that are gonna give ESG the kind of bite that we would like it to have. So their advocacy has actually helped. Um, so that would be kind of my, my, my thinking about the second point, but I think really that is something that I need to incorporate far more. And I need to be careful about the first one about being quite too cynical about the Realpolitik. But yes, I, th those are excellent comments and I'll, I'll, I'll put them in the next draft because that's precisely the kind of thing that I was hoping to, to, to get and to, to sharpen with, with the presentation. So thank you so, so very much for those comments. You're welcome. And uh, I suppose now we should turn it back to Jean-Marc and uh, see if there's some questions in the room. Is that right, Jean-Marc? Yes, thank you, Professor Ober, and then thank you, Professor Sorgens. Uh, now the floor is open for questions, if you have questions. Andy Sewe and Simba. Um, hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Cool. Uh, my name is Andy Sewe Sipamla. I'm from South Africa. I, I, while I do agree with you that we have to take a holistic approach and one that is centered around human rights and one that is not um, anthropocentric in nature, um, I would like you to dwell more on the equity. I think Professor Huber has mentioned it. Um, the equity in the developing countries specifically, whether you, you mentioned flexibility in, in, the, in the due diligence and how you look at these three considerations, but how flexible is it going to be in the context of developing countries in terms of enforcement and compliance? And, and considering of course the right to development and where we want to head as developing countries. And secondly, how about an accountability mechanism? As in, I have sort of like worked on due diligence in the environmental regulation, where lawyers just simply tick off boxes. What is the emission? Okay, tick, 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 tick. 
and that is it. And then they just write a due diligence for a company and advise and advise that everything is is above board. But how do you also sort of to sort of strengthen things? How about you introduce accountability mechanisms, not only for the company, um, not only by piercing the corporate veil to find who the parent companies are for the subsidiaries, but to pierce the veil further to look at who the directors are of that company and whether you can hold them personally liable. And any lawyers, because I know we also give sometimes advice on it without prejudice basis, any legal advice that is given in preparation for that specific project, which would finally be found to have adverse env environmental impact. Thank you. So let me uh, briefly answer those. I think those are excellent points. Um, I'm working at the moment on, with regard to your first point, on um, regulatory briefs with um, OPEC's general counsel on precisely the Global South perspective and to tease out the Global South perspective with regard to the right to development further. So this is kind of the, the blueprint for um, how one might look at these questions. And I will see how I can add more into the paper because that is really what um, my concern with this article has been. It is impossible to do energy transition right when one looks at it. Like, let me give you an example of something that I find galling. And uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff that I'm trying to work in you see uh, European carbon border adjustment proposals at the moment that um, make people feel good in the European Union about their energy transition progress. And what those things do in the real world is truly absurd and inequitable. So if you look at one of the possible impacts of carbon border adjustments is that goods from textiles from Vietnam are going to be less competitive in the European Union than textiles from Bangladesh. And the reason for this is that textiles from Bangladesh are going to have a lower carbon intensity than textiles from Vietnam. Now, so far all fine and good until you drill down into what is actually going on. Vietnam has a 30% renewable energy uh, portfolio mix, whereas Bangladesh has a 0.01% renewable energy mix. If you look at those two things, what is it that Bangladesh does more? Natural gas, whereas Vietnam has a higher coal impact. If you're then looking at, well, how does this play out? Why on earth is it that Vietnam is not relying on natural gas as much? Well, the answer, that's geopolitics. They would gladly rely on natural gas. They have natural gas adjacent to them. They just can't get access to it. So obviously they are going to have to rely on coal, which is something that can support their energy security. It's not for the European Union or anybody else for that matter to make these kinds of absurd assumptions that the reason that Vietnam is building coal-fired power plants is they're obviously bad actors. And I mean, it's those kind of equity concerns that we need to take a real hard look at why is it that countries are in their, in their development trajectory where they are and how can we support them rather than how is it that we can kind of find another cudgel to uh, you know, nudge them in a direction which we have no right whatsoever under a differentiated responsibility approach to do in the first place. So I fully, fully share your view that this is something that is uh, deeply unfair and that the global north needs to get its act together to understand its role and to understand how it can support rather than have a uh, you know, mock superior approach that tends to favor its own economic interests. Um, in terms of your, your um, second question about an accountability approach, I think that is something I, I agree with you. Uh, it probably goes beyond the scope of this particular paper. Um, to give you a sense of where I stand on that and kind of how I view it fitting in, I think that there is a real need for a broader global accountability mechanism for 
claims by local communities against um, businesses and against, um, well, sponsors of all forms of projects in the developing world. Now, what is interesting in that is that you will actually find lawyers for some of the world's largest resource companies that are responsible for a large share of these projects agree with that. They would rather be in an international forum where they have some kind of predictability than in a um, truly uh, chaotic system. Now, maybe I'm a bit naive in taking their word for it. Um, people tend to prefer to avoid liability altogether than to find a forum in which they can face up to it. Um, I still think that my view of kind of corporate departments would be that they're perfectly fine passing on costs so long as they know what the cost is so that then passing on the cost of doing it right is something they can bake into their own decision making so you could have a um, business and human rights arbitration mechanism such as the Hague rules at the back end of this that would be enforceable and use that in a better way. In terms of making lawyers responsible, um, I'm leery of that. Having been one of the lawyers who uh, represented private entities and had my colleagues arrested on charges I believe to have been trumped up and in one instance murdered in the Russian Federation, um, I would be careful about going after lawyers in that way. I do think we already have a mechanism and that is bar discipline. People who act in this way and give advice that is clearly contrary to law and clearly contrary to uh, ethical responsibilities should be disbarred. And I think that's kind of where you would probably find a lot more activity as things are gonna progress on the legal side. But that's just, I understand where you're coming from. Uh, I'm mad at those lawyers as well. I just have the experience of, um, you know, thugs picking up my colleagues the moment they land at the airport and then they were never seen again until their body was discovered three days later. So that's just kind of the, 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 the worry I have if we bring the lawyers into it too much. Thank you. We have one last question. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Bo, uh, for taking time to speak. Uh, I think about four days ago, five days ago, uh, there was a leak uh, of documents uh, relating to comments made by governments to the IPCC uh, report, uh, you know, with uh, governments such as Saudi Arabia, Australia, uh, some uh, non-governmental organizations in India speaking uh, heavily against some of the targets that are in that report. Uh, I don't know if you saw this, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on you know, how, how, how do you think this is an expression of what you talk about in the paper where uh, there are governments that are pushing back? Or do you think this is just government politicking, not necessarily the, uh, the approach that you advocate for in the paper? Well, I think part of the problem that you have is that you have a very antagonistic approach heading into COP26 in many ways. Um, the net zero 2050 pledges that are being pushed by the UK presidency are generally speaking things that are great for your economies if you have well-developed urban centers with an infrastructure that is capable of supporting a large share of renewables and you have a current unemployment problem. Um, so I'm describing the European Union, the UK, and the US here. It is less good for you if you are a developing economy that is still paying down debt on coal-fired power plants, and you rely on coal or oil and gas as a way for you to, um, you know, provide basic government services and um, raise revenue. So, I mean, part of that is just the, politi the political jockeying that goes on when you have a position that is extremely self-serving on the part of the global north, and then you have states like India that is heavily coal reliant, but 
amongst the fastest growing renewable fleet in the world. Then you have states like Saudi Arabia. I mean, Saudi Arabia um, made a net zero 2060 pledge just a couple of days ago. So it's not like they're not moving in the right direction. It's just that they're saying, guys, you can't do this this way. This is just the wrong way to go about it because you're, you're bullying. Um, so that's kind of how I would put it in the, in the larger term. In the, in the narrower term, we're leaving trillions of dollars worth of uh, resources in the ground. Anytime that you ask people to leave trillions of dollars worth of resources stranded, and to abandon infrastructure that it cost um, billions of dollars to build, you're going to get pushback. Um, the answer to that pushback, to my mind, lies in the fact that there needs to be equitable climate finance in order to support infrastructure development such that countries in the global south can actually meet the, um, the, the development goals they have set for themselves. And it can't be, and this is where, again, the Paris Agreement is just laughably falling short. It can't just be that we're financing mitigation strategies by outsourcing them. It must be that we're financing adaptation mechanisms in global South countries and building the trillion dollars worth of infrastructure so that by the time that you've built wind farms and solar arrays in sub-Saharan Africa, they actually have power to deliver to economic activity that is part of the green economy, rather than just saying, oh, we've replaced the coal-fired power plants, now everything is good. That is not what we owe. What we owe is the debt of bringing the global south into an equitable global economic order, and that is where we fall short. And I think that is kind of what you're seeing when India and Saudi Arabia are pushing back because they're seeing this as a way to use climate policy to benefit economic development at home when countries such as Germany, France, the UK and the US have had significant hurt from globalization and they're trying to claw it back under some pretense that I think to be totally and utterly unacceptable. Well, thank you so much, Professor Sorgens, and then thank you so much, Professor Ruber. And we really appreciate that. Hopefully we'll see you here next year. Wonderful, yeah, I hope to be able to come and that then hopefully with slightly less virus risk. Exactly. <laughs> All right. I hope you're enjoying your time in London, Rosorba. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I certainly will. And I uh, look forward to being back with you next semester. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks. Bye.